the customs of the noble ones is to delight in developing and to delight in letting go. The developing refers to developing skillful qualities in mind, developing the path. The letting go is the letting go of craving, ignorance, all the causes of suffering. This is an important point to keep in mind because we tend to forget it in different ways. One way of forgetting it is to delight in developing unskillful qualities. We like our greed, we like our lust, we like our anger. And so we nurture these things. When it may not be consciously doing it as a practice, but it is a habit we have. And it becomes a kind of nurturing, a kind of training the mind in that particular direction. But when it comes to actually developing the factors of the path, somehow it seems awfully hard. This is where we have to generate desire. This is where right effort comes in. To think about ways in which lust, aversion, and delusion really are not our friends. You might think of them as pets you keep around the house, but they're the kinds of pets that, if you're not careful, are going to turn around and eat you up. So it's important to think about, say, the, the drawbacks of lust. It's something we like a lot. But look at where it leads you. Think of all the stupid things you've done under the power of lust, all the harmful things you've done under the power of lust. And ask yourself, do you really want to have that take over your mind? Is it really a friend? Is it really a nice pet to have around the house? And think of all the crazy things that other people do under the influence of lust. Most murders, they say, have happened between people who have had sex with each other. If having sex were that good, why would they turn around and murder each other? Family court is the most vicious and violent of the different branches of the court system. Or just look at what lust does to the mind right here, right now, when it starts flaring up. Think about how much you lie to yourself, how many areas of the mind get shut down. As you focus on liking this and wanting that and totally ignoring all the consequences, the sort of narratives you build up in the mind are total fantasies. And to be attractive, they rely on all kinds of blind spots. Large parts of the mind just get shut down. Your reality principle goes out the window. You might want to ask, why does the mind do this to itself? It's something you really want to look into. You can also think about the, the pleasures you've had in the past. Where are they now? And what you have is the memory. And sometimes it includes the memory of the unskillful things you did around those pleasures. But as the Buddha said, if you don't have the pleasure that comes from a well-concentrated mind, no matter how much you think about the drawbacks of sensuality, the drawbacks of greed, aversion, and delusion, you can't let them go. You need another form of pleasure to replace the pleasure that comes from sensuality. This is why we have to develop the factors of the path. Primarily right mindfulness, right concentration. So learn to look at these pleasures as your friend. They don't cause you to do anything unskillful. You sometimes hear about the dangers of concentration, but the dangers of concentration are nothing compared with the dangers of sensuality. People don't kill, steal, cheat, 
have illicit sex, lie, take intoxicants because of jhana. Well, on the contrary, when you have the pleasure of a well-concentrated mind, it's a lot easier to let go of those other things. There's only one passage where the Buddha mentions the, the drawbacks of, of jhana in the canon. They're pretty minor. In other words, you get so attached to that pleasure that you really don't want to start looking into taking apart your sense of self the way you create a sense of self around things. He says it's like grabbing hold of a stick, a twig on a tree that has some sap, and your hand sticks to the t twig because of the sap. But that's an extremely minor drawback, and it's something that can be dealt with very easily. It's not nearly as dangerous as the, as the drawbacks of sensuality, which can pull you off the path entirely. So you want to work on developing a sense of pleasure in the form of the body, rather than in the visualization of the attractive details of the human body. In other words, you take the body you've got right here, right now. How would you relate to have this sense of body right here, right now? How can you find pleasure? Simply in sitting here and being aware of the fact that you've got a body here. This is where the breath comes in, because it's one of the functions of the body, one of the processes of the body that you can alter, that you can manipulate. And it takes a while to develop that skill. Sometimes you find yourself manipulating and it gets worse, which means you have to step back for a while and just learn to watch it. And then when you get a better sense of it, then you can try playing with it again, sensing where the different blockages are in the body. And how when you breathe in, you can get the breath energy to go all the way down. Learn to think of a subtle breath energy that doesn't require that you push or pull anything. As soon as you start breathing in, it goes through the whole nervous system. Try to get in touch with that breath energy and allow it to have a little bit more room, a little bit more ease and spreading through the body. So the breathing isn't a chore. It's nothing you have to do. The breath energy will do this on its own. You just have to allow it. Give it a little room, give it a little space. Open the mind to the possibility that this can happen, and you'll find that it does. When the energy is flowing well in the body, there's a greater sense of ease. Another way of doing this is think of relaxing the different muscles, starting with the muscles of the fingers and the hands, and then going up the arms. You can visualize the bones and say, okay, where there's, wherever there's any tension, that's not bone tension, it's muscle tension. So allow the muscles around those particular bones to relax, and then visualize the bones up through the arms, up to the shoulders. Then start again at the feet, go up the feet, the, the legs, through the pelvis, up the backbone, up the neck, the skull of the head. Wherever you sense any tension or tightness, allow it to relax. And the energy in the body will flow a lot more smoothly and easily. This way, as you develop the factors of right concentration, you make it easier to let go of your other attachments. You've got something better to hold on to. And this is also why it's important to understand that the practice is not just one of letting go. There has to be the developing as well. And John Fuang once noticed, noted this. He says sometimes you hear that it's all about letting go, but no, you have to develop. If you don't develop things, develop skillful qualities in the mind, you can't really let go of the unskillful ones. So it's not just a matter of watching, 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 and letting the defilements just slough off. There are some defilements that will slough off simply by watching them, but not all of them. There's somewhere you have to, as the Buddha says, exert a fabrication. In other words, you have to do something intentional in order to get past them. Like working with the breath, that's bodily fabrication. The way you breathe can 
help weaken a lot of the defilements. So at the very least, they don't control your sense of the body. And you can see exactly what they're doing exclusively in the mind. They're a lot easier to deal with when they're not in charge of your breath, not in charge of the way the blood's flowing in the body, not in charge of the different physical processes in the body. For instance, when anger arises, if you can breathe calmly during the anger, then the anger hasn't hijacked your body, and it's a lot easier to deal with the anger directly. Another way of dealing with or exerting a fabrication is exerting verbal fabrication. It's direct a thought and evaluation. This could either be directing your thoughts to the breath and evaluating the breath, or looking at the defilement simply as an event in the mind and analyzing it, noticing what stress it creates, which parts of the body, and how it clouds the mind. In other words, instead of looking at the object of your lust or the object of the anger, just look at the fact of the lust or the anger in the mind as it's happening and see what it's doing. So that you're not siding with it, you're stepping back from a bit and you're evaluating, do you really want to go along with this? Is this really your friend? The third type of fabrication is mental fabrication, feelings and perceptions. Again, this relates, can relate to the breath. You create a sense of ease and well-being in the body. That feeling that makes it a lot easier to let go of the, the need for immediate gratification through a defilement. You say, look, I've got this pleasure here. As you relax your hands, relax your feet, that seems to open up a lot of other channels in the body. So you can have a sense of well-being right here, right now, that doesn't depend on expressing anger or following your lust. Then you change that perception again to see if you perceive lust or anger as your friend, you're going to go running along with it every time it comes. Learn to look at it in a different way. Here comes a cloud to obscure the mind. Or as John Lee says, here come some crooks and thieves and con men. They want you to see things their way, and then when the police come to catch you, they go running off. You're the one that's left having to be responsible for what you did. So you want to use these three forms of fabrication, bodily fabrication, verbal fabrication, and mental fabrication, when you find that simply watching and defilement is not enough. Simply being equanimous is not enough. Because after all, equanimity and mindfulness, these are fabrications too. They're very subtle fabrications. Equanimity in particular. Mindfulness requires a lot more conscious work. There's a belief someplace, you hear it sometimes, that mindfulness is unfabricated. But it's not the case. It's part of the path. It's something you do. It's something you develop. And at certain stages in the practice, you do let it go. As John Munn said, there does come a point in the practice where all four noble truths become one. What he means is that they all have the same duty. In the beginning, you have to comprehend stress. You have to let go of the cause develop the path so you can realize the cessation of suffering, the cessation of stress. And that's the point, though, when you have to let go of all four truths. As John Munn said, it's nirvana lies outside the four truths. Each of them has a duty. There's nothing you do with nirvana. At that point, you let everything go. 
But if you haven't reached that point, the Four Noble Truths still have their duties. You still have to do these things. You still have to learn how to delight in letting go and delight in developing. So there's work to be done, but it's good work. Without this work, you stay stuck in your old ways and suffering in the same old way over and over and over again. As the Buddha says, the amount of suffering that's left for someone who hasn't seen the Dharma is like all the water in the oceans of the earth, whereas the amount of suffering left for someone who has seen the Dharma has touched the deathless just like the water in, that you would hold in your hand. When you think about things in that way, that's a good perception to hold in mind. So even though the practice is difficult, realize it's a, a lot less difficult than not practicing. And if you can train the mind to delight in developing the path, you're well on your way. <laughs>